One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent, so taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, If one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them as this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and so I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told the servant, Go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in, so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. And the Old Testament reading. After the death of Saul, David returned from striking down the Amalekites and stayed in Ziklag two days. On the third day, a man arrived from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. Then he came to David and he fell on the ground to pay him honor. Where have you come from? David asked him. He answered, I have escaped from the Israelite camp. What happened? David asked me. The man fled from the battle, he replied. Many of them fell and died, and Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. Then David said to the young man who brought him the report, How do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, the man said, and there was Saul leaning on his spear with a chariot and their drivers in hot pursuit. When he turned around and saw me, he called out to me, and I said, What can I do? He asked me, Who are you? An Amalekite, I answered. Then he said to me, Stand here by me and kill me. I'm in the throes of death, but I'm still alive. So I stood beside him and killed him, because I knew that after he had fallen, he could not survive. And I took the crown that was on his head and the band on his arm, and I brought them here to my Lord. Then David and all the men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. They mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan, and for the army of the Lord and for the nation of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. David said to the young man, brought him the report, Where are you from? I am the son of a foreigner, an Amalekite, he answered. David asked him, Why weren't you afraid to lift your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called one of his men and said, Go strike him down. So he struck him down, and he died. For David had said to him, Your blood be on your head. Your own mouth testified against you when you said, I killed the Lord's anointed. David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan, and he ordered the people of Judah to be taught this lament and bow. It is written in the book of Jashar. A gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel, and how the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. Mountains of Gilboa, may you have neither dew nor rain, may no showers fall on your terraced fields. For there the shield of the mighty was despised, the shield of Saul no longer rubbed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back. The sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan... 
In life they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle! Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You are very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. How the mighty have fallen, the weapons of war have perished. In the course of time, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? He asked. The Lord said, Go up. David asked, Where shall I go? To the Hebron, the Lord answered. So David went up there with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David also took the men who were with him, each with his family, and they settled in Hebron and its towns. Then the men of Judah came to Hebron, and they anointed David king over the tribe of Judah. When David was told that it was the men from Jabesh Gilead who had buried Saul, he sent messages to them to say, The Lord bless you for showing this kindness to your soul, your master, by burying him. May the Lord now show you kindness and faithfulness, and I too will show you the same favor because you have done this. Now then, be strong and brave. Saul, your master, is dead, and the people of Judah have anointed me king over them. Meanwhile, Abner, son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, had taken Ish-bosheth, son of Saul, and brought him over to Menhenaim. He made him king over Gilead, Ashuri, and Jezreel, and also over Ephraim, Benjamin, and all Israel. Ish-bosheth, son of Saul, was forty years old when he became king over Israel, and he reigned two years. The tribe of Judah, however, remained loyal to David. The length of time David was king in Hebron over Judah was seven years and six months. Abner, son of Ner, together with the men of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, left Manaheim and went to Gibeon. Joab, son of Zeruiah, and David's men went out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. One group sat down on one side in the pool and one group on the other side. Then Abner said to Joab, Let's have some of the young men get up and fight hand to hand in front of us. All right, let them do it, Joab said. So they stood up and were counted off, twelve men from Benjamin and Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and twelve for David. Then each man grabbed his opponent by the head and thrust his dagger into his opponent's side, and they all fell down together. So that place in Gibeon was called Helkath Hazarim. The battle that day was very fierce, and Abner and the Israelites were defeated by David's men. The three sons of Zeruiah were there, Joab, Abishai, and Asheshel. Now Asahel was as fleet-footed as a wild gazelle. He chased Abner, turning neither to the right nor the left as he pursued him. Abner was looked behind him and asked, Is that you, Asahel? It is, he answered. Then Abner said to him, Turn to aside to the right or to the left. Take on one of the young men and strip him of his weapons. But Asahel would not stop chasing him. Again, Abner warned Asahel, Stop chasing me. Why should I strike you down? How could I look your brother Joab in the face? But Asahel refused to give up the pursuit. So Abner thrust the butt of his spear into Asahel's stomach, and the spear came out through his back. He fell there and died on the spot, and every man stopped when he came to the place where Asahel had fallen and died. But Joab and Abishai pursued Abner, and as the sun was setting, they came to the hill of Ammah near Jia on the way to the wasteland of Gibeon. Then the men of Benjamin rallied behind Abner. They formed themselves into a group and took their stand on top of a hill. Abner called out to Joab, Must the sword devour forever? Don't you realize this will end in bitterness? How long before you order your men to stop pursuing their fellow Israelites? Joab answered, As surely as God lives, if you had not spoken, the men would have continued pursuing them until morning. So Joab blew the trumpet, and all the troops came to a halt. They no longer pursued Israel, nor did they fight any more. All that night, Abner and his men marched through the Arabah. They crossed Jordan, continued through the morning hours, and came to Manahnaheim. Then Joab stopped pursuing Abner and assembled the whole army beside Asahel. Nineteen of David's men were found missing, but David's men had killed 360 Benjamites who were with Abner. They took Asahel and buried him in his father's tomb at Bethlehem. Then Joab and his men marched all night and arrived at Hebron by daybreak.